to understand we are actually designed, we are built for loss. We are designed to take a number of hits this lifetime. But when our loved one dies and their story is over, you have to grieve fully and find a way to live fully. And it is so easy, I think, for us to get lost in only their story and to think that life is over. Part of meaning for me is reminding people of their power after death, reminding people they still have a story. Your loved one's life was precious and so is yours. And you continuing to live it is not a disloyalty to them, but you can live a life that honors them. That makes sense. Do you, do you also find that there are particular kinds of deaths? I think you talk about this in, in the book, you know, suicide, um, drug overdose, stillbirth. There's certain kinds of deaths where perhaps it's harder to articulate the pain or in the case of suicide, there's social stigma, which means, you know, people face maybe cultural social barriers as well as psychological ones to finding meaning. And we're trying to slowly but surely make that transition to understanding the reality of our being mentally compromised is an illness, it's not a choice. And addiction is an illness, not a choice. And, you know, my hope is I was privileged years ago to work with an actor here, Michael Landon. And Michael Landon's from a number of TV shows, Little House on the Prairie and all that from my childhood. And he went on one of our big shows here, The Tonight Show. And it was the first time a celebrity talked openly about cancer. And my father would tell me how when he grew up, there was a shame and stigma around cancer. And I look forward to the day because now we go, what, why would there be a shame or stigma to cancer? I look forward to the day we realize whether it's our mental capacity, our mental illness, our mental health, our, um, our addictions that we realize those are illnesses too and not deserving of a stigma. And we, we will move beyond that. Absolutely, I, lo I love the bit of your book where you have a kind of chart where you have mental illness, physical illness, and you compare the reaction. You know, mental illness, you know, it's your fault. Physical illness, you kind of get empathy and it's not your fault. And again, the kind of patterns and the way that that can impact the person grieving. And I think you're right, we need to change the way we, we talk about and understand mental illness. And actually, I think when the science gives us a bit more, as, as I think, again, you say about addiction and, and, and mental illness, we'll see this as ridiculous, a bit like, you know, the way we talked about cancer. Right. You know, then there was a time people said, what did I do to bring about this cancer? I mean, you know, it's interesting. I did a talk recently on positive toxicity that we can you know, and toxic positivity that we can, you know, sort of turn a why exploration into self-blame without realizing it. That we're going, what did I do to create this cancer? Or what did I do that caused the death of my loved one? And you sort of ignore the illness, but go to your own self-blame, which is really part of bargaining and the what ifs and if onlys. And that's where I find a lot of my work with people is, is helping them with the what ifs and the if onlys and the self blame that is normal in grief, but we don't, we, it's a place we're going to visit. You just don't want to live there. And I think it's also a place people get stuck at, especially with those deaths you've mentioned.